Good evening and welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee of Tamworth Borough Council. Um, I'm at apologies item one and the chair has given his apologies for this evening's meeting and his substitute is councillor Simon Goodall. I've also received apologies from councillor Janice Wadrup and the portfolio holder for homelessness prevention, councillor Farrell has sent his apologies for the item later on the agenda. Are there any other apologies that any members are aware of? Okay, so as the chair has sent his apologies and as we have a vacancy at the moment for the position of vice chair, um, in accordance with the procedural rules set out in the constitution as an officer in democratic services, I'm opening um, this meeting and I'd like to ask for nominations from the members of this committee to act as chair for this meeting, please. Do I have a nomination? Councillor Goodall. Thank you. Yeah, uh, nominate uh, Councillor Sam Smith. Thank you, Councillor Goodall. Do I have a seconder for that nomination? Councillor Rogers. For Councillor Samuel Smith to be chair of this meeting, please. Could those in favour raise their hands? And thank you. And those against? Okay, that motion is carried then. So, Councillor Sam, sorry, those who, anybody want to abstain? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Councillor Smith is then nom um, elected a chair of this meeting. Thank you, and he'll carry on from here. I'd just like to make sure everybody's aware that the meeting as normal is being recorded and will go on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. I'll just make my way up. Just want to say thank you very much, members. Uh, might as well get straight into it. So uh, we do need to appoint a vice chairman for the committee. Um, can I ask for any nominations for vice chair for this committee? Councillor Goodall. Thank you. Happy to nominate Councillor Sam Smith. Thank you. And uh, can I ask for a seconder? Thanks very much. Um, so um, I guess that's uh, that's it. So we need to take a vote. Ah, we need to take a vote. So um, can you raise your hands if you vote for this? Thank you very much. That's carried. Thank you very much, all. Much appreciated. So, um, we just need to start with agenda item number three, and this is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, so, do we have, and this meeting, by the way, the last one was the 29th of November, 2022. Can I request a mover and a seconder? Councillor Claymore? Yes, I'll, I'll move that um, those minutes is correct. And uh, a seconder? Councillor Cook, thank you very much. And that's carried. Ah, 
we need to vote. So um, if you'd like to raise your hand if you vote for this. Thank you. Yeah. That's carried, thank you. Okay, so uh, declarations of interest. This is uh, item agenda number four. Uh, does anyone have any declarations of interest? So no. So um, agenda item number five, update from the chair. I've no further updates at this moment in time other than the agenda items. Agenda item number six, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. No recommendations have been made to Cabinet since the last meeting. <clears throat> Agenda number seven is consideration for matters referred to Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet to Council, and there are no new items. Agenda number eight updates on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. So there was a County Council meeting on the 28th of November. Uh, a written update has been circulated. You will see that we have an update um, from that Staffordshire meeting received feedback on the Healthier Communities Workshop, which had been run earlier in 2022 which the council had specifically identified for consideration by district and borough committees. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that particular agenda item? Okay, moving on. So, Number nine, agenda number nine, delivery of disabled adaptations in Tamworth. So this item was previously considered a year ago and uh, we have the Assistant Director of Assets, Paul Weston, um, to provide an update. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so you'll be aware, as a local authority, we have uh, a responsibility for delivering disabled adaptations to residents of Tamworth. It falls into two distinct categories. We have disabled facilities grants and disabled facilities adaptations. The disabled facilities grants are a statutory function, and that's provided to everyone or is accessible to everyone, subject to various means testing uh, and medical assessments, with the exception of council housing tenants. For some reason, that's just the way legislation set up. So for our council housing tenants, we have something called disabled facilities adaptations. So that's why you'll see the two, two different terms referenced. In essence, we treat them largely the same uh, in the process in terms of initial access to that service and the way the service is delivered. Uh, key differences are there is no means testing for our council tenants and we don't have to worry about things like landlord permissions and consents for council tenants because we are the landlord. For the last several years now, uh, we've been delivering our statutory obligation through external suppliers uh, and working in partnership with several of the districts within Staffordshire uh, and also Staffordshire County Council. The current contract arrangements come to an end on the 31st of March and it was essentially decided that a number of the authorities or districts in Staffordshire didn't want to engage in further partnership arrangements with external suppliers and wanted to take it back in-house. Uh, as a result of that, we were unable to meet the critical mass required to go out to procure this type of work. So the decision was made to bring it back in-house and deliver the service in-house. So we've been working with the other districts and with County Council uh, over the last few months to start developing that service. And we're at a point now where we have uh, process maps, we've got supply chain identified, we've got process in place and forms in place. Stafford Borough Council are procuring a framework for occupational therapy services. 
uh, so that will be in place as well. So really we're at a point now where it's, it's starting to come together in terms of the actual setup for it. There will be a report going to uh, the staffing committee next week, sorry, no, this week, uh, to start to look to recruit into the roles that will be required to deliver that service. There will be some transfer of employees from the existing supplier into that service under what's known as TUPI. Uh, that's fairly, fairly commonplace when services transfer from one organisation to another. Uh, there's still some issues around IT that need to be resolved, uh, but we're working on those with our IT, sister, uh, with our IT team. And effectively, we will deliver the same type of service that we've been receiving from those external suppliers. The statutory obligation for us as a local authority is to receive grant applications, consider them in line with the legislation and either approve or reject them and then for approved grants make payments. We're not obliged to provide any support or assistance in the delivery of those grants. However, as an authority over the past several years, We've engaged the services of external agents to assist people in making those grant applications, project managing the works on site, because we recognise that a lot of people don't have those skills themselves. Uh, and if left to just deal with it themselves, it probably wouldn't happen and you'd have a lot of unmet demand. So it, I think it's important that we actually continue to provide that level of service to people and actually support them right the way through the process from the point at which they make an initial application through County Council to the point at which they actually have the works done for them. With our own tenants, we've always done that because they're our tenants, they're our property, so we, we, you know, that just becomes part of our normal planned works programme and capital works programme. But with Disabled Facilities Grants, so that's sort of the private sector or anyone who's not our tenant, uh, that support is additional. It's not part of that statutory obligation so it's something that we do over and above that and the view is that we'll continue to do that and support people through that process. In terms of the process itself in applying for a grant, nothing's really going to change for uh, grant applicants in the way that the way things work. We're working closely with Staffordshire County Council on making sure that we have a fairly consistent front door service or access point for all districts in the council uh, in in Staffordshire, they will do that initial assessment of need. Uh, and the reason we've sort of left it with the county council on that one is because some people don't just need an adaptation; they also need support packages and other things that sit completely outside of disabled facilities grants. Uh, and what it does is it means they sort of have that initial assessment. They might get diverted just straight to a disabled facilities grant or they might get pushed into uh, care packages or the care system somewhere else and a grant or it may well be just into the care system so it makes sense to sit, continue to sit with the county council on that front what they will then do is where they believe that a person needs an adaptation they'll then pass that over to us to sort of pick up the process from that point and we will do the assessments uh, develop their adaptation for them through to the delivery phases. We will sort of deal with all of the uh, means testing and charges on properties and anything of, on, uh, of that nature. In terms of the statutory side of things, nothing changes on that front. It's, you know, it's set up within the legislation around DFGs. So in terms of the amount of money available for individual grants, that hasn't changed and that won't change. Uh, as a district, we probably have more demand than we can fund in any given year. Uh, so we're not, we're not in a position really to have sort of, uh, grants through a, a non-statutory grant. So all of ours are the statutory grant process. We don't have any sort of, uh, sort of concessionary type arrangements, which some districts would have, which would top up uh, grants for people. Uh, so it does mean that some people would be means tested out and wouldn't be able to sort of have the work done. Some people will have to make a contribution themselves towards the cost of the works, but that, that's as it is now and that's, that's set out in the legislation. As I understand it, there are, or there is a review at government level 
on disabled adaptations and disabled facilities grants. That's something that's been talked about for a few years now, uh, not materialised yet. Our hope is that as part of that we'll see perhaps a more fair distribution of the grants within Staffordshire. Uh, so that we aren't the lowest recipients within Staffordshire, but that's, that's out, again, outside of our control, and it's something we'll just have to wait and see. In terms of sort of the delivery side, key, key risks for us still remain at the moment, resources. Uh, obviously, we've got to bring staff in to deliver this service, and the financial side of it, again, hasn't changed at the moment. So in terms of the amount of grant we get through central government, uh, compared to our demand, it's still a, an area of risk for us. But overall, the, the aim is that by 1st of April, we will have that service in place. It will be a slow launch. We're not looking to sort of go into it all guns blazing because I don't think that would actually help anyone. So we just want to sort of steadily roll into it. There's likely to be a backlog of work that comes from the current, uh, current contractor. That's normal. I think every time we've moved contractors on this service, there has been a bit of a backlog, and it's usually because some of the some of the stuff that's been coming through probably since December, they just wouldn't physically be able to complete by the end of the contract, so it, it gets backlogged. So there will be an element of that. Uh, in, in terms of the process for your, you know, for your constituents. Nothing should change for them. They still go through that county council front door service. That's where we would always recommend they're directed and they get picked up through that and then it will come through the channels and be directed in the, uh, to the right places. Uh, so shouldn't be any change in that front. And once we know who's delivering that service in terms of staffing wise, obviously we'll share that information around. Uh, contact details should be on the website uh, in time for the new contract. I think, you know, Again, contact numbers for Staffordshire County Council, I don't believe will be changing, so those are already on uh, on the website, uh, but more details will be provided as we go along. I think if it hasn't already gone out, it will be going out imminently. A letter from the current supplier to anyone who's already on their waiting list to notify them of the change and what that means for them, so they should be aware of that. Uh, so certainly within the next couple of weeks uh, so that that's going out so no one should be left unaware of what's happening with their particular case and really that's i suppose that's where we are at the moment it's you know it's progressing and all being well we should be in a position to just continue with that service take up take it from where the current contractor is and continue to deliver a properly managed service as opposed to just letting people fend for themselves and apply for grants. So that was sort of really, I suppose, a whistle-stop update really on it at the moment. Thank you, Paul. Um, just like to open this up to the committee. Is there anybody that has any questions? Councillor Goodall. Thanks, Chair. And I apologise if, uh, if this has been covered at a previous report, but how many individual adaptation sort of grants do we process a year on average roughly it's it's variable because some of it will depend on the the value of those jobs i think you know i think at last count it was a couple of hundred a year but again it, it really is variable because the maximum grant available is thirty five thousand. uh our allocation from central government through the Better Care Fund is 546,000, I believe it was. So if you get a lot of the higher higher cost jobs, clearly you don't get to do as many of them. So it's, it is variable. <laughs> Councillor, carry on. Thanks, sir. Just follow up. Um, do we see a trend in number of jobs or going, going in a... Or, or is it pretty much flat, generally? Thanks. It's it increased steadily over the years, as you'd expect. We've got an ageing population. Uh, I suppose medical medical treatments have become better, and sort of people are perhaps surviving illnesses that historically they might not have done. So we are seeing that upward trend, but it's fairly steady. It's not you know there's not peaks and troughs. There's 
an awful lot of things like stair lifts and level access showers. I mean, those are the most common types of uh, adaptations, as you'd expect. Ramps and handrails. So it's the usual stuff to get people in and out the property and circulate around the, the property and use the property themselves so that they're not in sort of residential care or uh, that type of thing. Councillor Great to X. Thank you. Um, you said a few moments ago that some people have to make a contribution. What proportion of people have to make a contribution and what are the sort of circumstances where their contribution is required? Unfortunately, I couldn't give you the numbers on contributions. I could certainly find that out and share it sort of after, after the uh, meeting with you. Uh, there's a, there's a, a process within the legislation that sets out a means test, which is effectively you work through, it, it looks at their income, uh, savings, capital assets, all of those sorts of things. And at the end of it, it gives you a figure that says their contribution towards this work would be. Uh, and it can be, you know, it could be almost anything from they have 100% contribution because they could afford to pay all of it through to a few pounds. So it, it is variable, but it's, it's a, there's a formal sort of calculation you have to go through to arrive at that means test. And it's done on a one, you know, an individual basis. Every applicant, and I say every applicant, it doesn't apply to children's cases, uh, only adult cases. But every applicant's going to be assessed on their own merits for that purpose. And it just follows the same process for everyone in terms of the calculation. But the outcome will vary depending on what, what numbers you plug in for that person. Councillor Goodall, I'll come to you afterwards. Thank you, yeah. Um, and again, I apologise if this has been looked at and is slightly out of the remit of the report, but um, if, if, for instance, a, a stair lift's fitted to a, a property and then no longer required, does that become redundant? Can it be used again? Is there a... Can hardware be reused, I guess, is the, is the question. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I'm afraid there's no definitive answer on it. Yes, it can be if it's a below a certain age and in good condition. Uh, most of the stair lift companies, once the, once the lift, the actual mechanics of a lift get to about five years old, they sort of start to say, actually, you've had your life out of it at that point, and it's, it probably isn't recyclable. The other issue with tracks and stuff like that is they tend to have to be made for the staircase they're going on so they're not always reusable because every staircase you know i say every staircase but you know the staircase will be different in different properties and it's not always possible to reuse them but where where we where they can yes they do tend to get reused uh as part of the grant application we try to sort of ha on our own properties clearly the stair lift belongs to us so that's fine on grant applications technically the stair lift because it's been done through a grant belongs to the individual, but most people accept that if if they no longer require it for whatever reason, if it can be recycled, they'll offer it up for recycling. But as I say, it really does depend on age and condition. Councillor Rosie Claymore. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Paul, for all that information. Just a bit of clarity, please. You said it doesn't apply in children's cases, the means tested. So the parents or whoever the child is living with wouldn't be means tested is that what we're saying yeah where, it, where the adaptation is applied for on behalf of a child so it's a, a sort of anyone under the age of 18 there is no means testing for that for that application it's only for adults cases so it doesn't apply to the parents or carers or anyone else the child is the applicant there's no means testing thank you Are there any more questions from committee members? Uh, Councillor, uh, great. Yes, thank you, Chair. Following on from what Councillor Goodall said, um, if you do some fairly extensive work, let's say in a local authority house, and unfortunately that resident dies shortly afterwards, what happens to the equipment? Do you make sure that somebody else who's in need gets that house, or does that expensive equipment have to be taken out? Wherever possible, we do try to make use of the property 
for someone who needs that type of adaptation. Not always possible because we don't always have people on the waiting list who require that type of adaptation. In terms of equipment, if it was something like a stair lift and it was relatively new, then yeah, that would get recycled if the incoming tenant didn't want it. Uh, so it, it depends on what it is, but where possible, we do try to look for matching people with properties. Similarly, if a person requires an adaptation, one of our, one of our own tenants uh, puts in for a, an adaptation, our housing uh, officers teams will also look to try and find an already adapted property for that person rather than adapting a new property. Again, not always possible because we don't always have the right, you know, a property that's adapted in the way that person needs, or it may not be in the area where their existing support mechanisms are. So it's not always possible, but we always explore it, even if it's only to sort of say, actually, yet yeah, we've looked and it's not possible to do in this instance. Uh, because it makes makes sense for us to try and recycle those properties if we can, but it's not always possible. Are there any more questions from committee members? Okay, so um, we do have to uh, move this to a recommendation. Uh, the recommendation recommendation in the report is to note the report itself. Um, so for this, we do need to need a mover and a seconder. Uh, so that's Councillor Greater X and seconded by uh, Rosie Claymore. Thank you, Paul, for coming in tonight. Much appreciated. Have a good night. So uh, moving on to agenda item 10. <coughs> so update on the homeless, homelessness data successes and the homeless hub. Uh, so the meeting in November 2022, last meeting, we received an update on the homelessness, including the winter relief project. And the committee requested that it uh, receive further information data on the success of the work to prevent homelessness, an opportunity to consider the the homeless, homelessness hub proposals further before these were presented to cabinet. So uh, for this, uh, is, we have the assistant director of neighborhoods, Tina Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you, chair, for that. Um, good evening, councillors, colleagues. Um, you've got a fairly detailed report you know, in the pack, um, which, as the chair has already pointed out, was in part information requested following the presentation that um, myself and the head of homelessness and housing solutions gave on the 29th of November. Um, so at that meeting, um, the committee had asked for a further breakdown of the homelessness data and prevention figures and the reasons for homelessness. Um, which I'll outline some of those headlines, which is covered in section four of the report, um, and also how the principles were emerging for the development of a homelessness hub, which is currently on the... I do apologise for interrupting. You might want to bring the oh, microphone sorry, a little bit more oh, forward. Oh, yes, so, thank just you. Just so we can hear. Thank you. Thank you. Is that better? bit of an echo now. Um, so then the second part of the report was to look at the key principles and um, how that were being developed around the concept of a homelessness hub, which is on the Cabinet's forward plan for the 23rd of um, February. Um, so just as I take you through the report, the section three, which is the executive summary, is a recap really from the presentation in November, explaining our obligations as a council around the Homelessness Reduction Act that came into force on the 3rd of April 2018, and that placed um, complex duties on councils to both relieve and prevent homelessness and sets out um, the definitions in relation to that. Um, every quarter, the team are required to submit data to the government through their portal known as HCLIC, which is the Homelessness Case Level uh, Information and Collection, which 
reflects on how many people are in temporary accommodation and how many people have approached us in terms of that. Um, and some of that detail was reported to you in November. Um, so in summary, the top five reasons applicants are approaching us for homelessness or threatened with homelessness um, are as listed at 3.4, which are either asked to leave by friends or family, because of ending a private rented tenancy due to relations, relationship breakdown, domestic abuse or ending a social housing tenancy. And they mirror largely the national um, top five reasons for that. So in terms of homelessness prevention and relief, um, there are detailed definitions in the Code of Guidance around this, but basically homelessness prevention means providing people with the ways and means to address their housing and other needs to avoid homelessness, um, compared with homelessness relief, where an authority and a council has been unable to prevent that homelessness, but help someone to secure accommodation, even though the authority is under no obligation to do so. Um, so you'll see um, over the page what the figures are in relation to, to that. So in terms of the total numbers of applicants um, where we have successfully prevented or relieved or accepted a main duty in relation to that homelessness, you'll see the figures um, are slightly down um, and that reflects a national trend um, in that they're not back to pre-pandemic levels yet. But you can see it's you know, it's not largely down. Those figures, 2020, were 260, 2021, 244. And so far, up until the end of the third quarter, as of this year, we're 173. So we're expecting that to pretty much uh, be there or thereabouts from previous years. But on top of that, um, the service also records all the approaches where we've worked with applicants and families and households and where cases have been closed because we've given advice and assistance or we've triaged or we've signposted that family onto alternative or more settled housing solutions. And as you can see, those figures range between 409 you know, to 388 in the last year. So that's a combined activity, if you like, of nearly 700 cases that that team manages in terms of harmlessness prevention and relief annually. That's in addition to those people who contact us and make applications to go on the council's housing register. Um, and last year we had 1,600 of those, of which there's around four to 500 who are currently on the register. So that also provides a significant opportunity to work with clients in terms of that, that assessment, in terms of their housing needs. So there's some information in the report which says, you know, those figures are broadly the same. There's a slight decrease, but, you know, nothing that would undermine the general trend and it as it says it's consistent with natural with national trends um, so the performance of the team remains positive um, some of the data which we align to our homelessness and rough sleeping strategy is that can Tamworth continues to enjoy really low numbers in temporary accommodation especially bed and breakfast we've had single figures in bed and breakfast for the last two years or so um, so that reflects the emphasis around early intervention and prevention and the focus around only using that crisis accommodation if we have to. We also are able to use some of our own council stock for self-contained and temporary accommodation and we've currently got around 20 units of that um, where there's support provided by the team um, in terms of that wraparound and that holistic uh, care if you like. Um, when HAST visited us in July last year, HAST is the Homelessness Advisory Support Team. They're appointed by the government to come and talk to Tamworth and support us in terms of homelessness prevention. And they observed and we were able to report through the various committees and cabinet that there was a number of strengths around our commitment to prevention and we're proud of that. And that was also reflected in rough, the rough sleeping numbers. Um, we do an annual estimate with partners that's independently verified um, and we submitted the figures of two both of which were um, supported and moved on into alternate accommodation within that following few days 
Um, so in terms of the figures, there's a lot of data there and it is incredibly complex. Um, you know, what we're also um, have been identified as good practice is that we do try and stop the revolving door syndrome. So we have low numbers in terms of repeat homelessness and that's also reflected in those figures. But hopefully that gives the committee a flavour of some of the data that we pointed to back in November. Um, the second area which is around the development of the homelessness hub, so this concept was born out of the really successful work we did with partners at Sacred Heart and um, Tamworth CIC uh, together um, around our severe weather emergency protocols or SHWEP as we uh, refer to it which is usually triggered in adverse uh, weather such as winter and it provides that winter relief. What we found was that that support around um, triage, signposting people um, in terms of uh, debt advice and mental health support and other partners was incredibly successful so the view was that the homelessness hub would be commissioned subject to cabinet approving it uh, in February would be commissioned and extend that so it's not just a winter relief program but it is all year round and provides that um, opportunity as it sets out in section five of the report um, it really links back to our strategic pro priorities around prevention and early intervention, so it provides that drop-in support. It would allow members of our team to meet with the Tamworth, Tamworth Advice Centre colleagues to help with debt advice. It would help with um, extended job and training. It would help with a range of life skills um, to support people through that process. It would provide advice and support around people's holistic housing options. Um, it would look to work with um, all the community safety partnerships to help um, support people into longer term and settled accommodation. And it really would provide that sort of floating support. People, we talked about last time housing first, which is about recognising that people's fundamental right is to have a decent, safe, warm home on which to um, you know, live uh, and improve their quality of life. And it's about having that housing first approach and about providing that tailored access to service, um, recognising that through the hub or through um, the arrangements we've already got in place, people do prefer to access that um, in that way um, as we move to different models in terms of how we uh, interact. So, yeah, so the report sets out... Um, what the intention is around that and the view is um, and we welcome committee's comments in terms of any onward recommendations to cabinet around this but the view is that we would commission that service to provide that on a year round basis um, so the recommendations are in the put report chair happy to take any questions thank you do you members of the committee have any questions councillor simon simon goodall thank you chair um so, just, just so I'm clear, the, the uh, homeless prevention and rough sleeping strategy was from 2020. So we've got that data. Can that be compared with what we had before, before that new strategy was, uh, was incorporated? And it might be helpful to have that data maybe at a future time to see if we've made any progress from, from before and after the new strategy. Thank you, Councillor Goodall. Yes, absolutely. What the Cabinet report will do in February is set out the priorities within that homelessness and rough sleeping strategy and their achievements since that date, recognising that we're now sort of three years into what was a five-year plan. Um, it will have some of that evidence and intelligence around numbers that I've referred to earlier, because that you know, is an important diagnostic around, well, has those interventions worked and is it ha having an impact? And we'll draw some of those conclusions, so absolutely. And you'll see from this report that those strategic priorities within the homelessness and rough sleeping strategy around prevention, rapid pathways for rough sleeping, improving the supply of affordable accommodation, improving the quality of services to homelessness, um, and people threatened with homelessness and improving health and well-being aspirations are all directly linked to the delivery of the homelessness hub. So it's whilst the data and the intelligence is important in terms of, you know, how's that impacting on numbers, how are we driving down repeat homelessness, I think what 
the cabinet report will do and what this report's paved the way for is it's about those housing first principles and it's about how we've moved that on as well as um, because in fairness our um, homelessness figures were already good even pre-strategy you know sort of pre um, 20 sort of 18 2019 we were seeing before that around 100 households in bed and breakfast we had got triple figures at some point we've not seen those figures for the last three to four years and that is about some of those strategic interventions so yeah the report will detail that more fully thank you thank you yeah yeah it just would be good to see that longer term trend but thank thank you does anybody have any more questions Okay, so there is a recommendation uh, which we've heard. So we need a mover and a seconder. Uh, Councillor Cook would like to move and second Councillor Greater X. Thank you very much. It's been moved. Uh, we need to quit, uh, take a vote if we can have a show of hands to vote on this, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Tina, for coming in and uh, giving that, that giving us that information. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. Thank you. So, moving on to agenda item number 11 is the forward plan. Uh, so, this is to consider uh, any further items to uh, be considered on the forward plan. Uh, is there anybody that, that would like to make a consideration? Nope. Oh, Councillor Kingstone. Thank you, Chair. Um, over the recent months, I've been receiving repeated um, questions, queries about the state of our housing stock in relation to particularly people's health. Now, um, there are lots of factors I appreciate for this. I wonder if it would be possible to put for some future work plan, and I'm not considering suggesting for the next two meetings because this, this would be a much bigger piece of work than could be delivered within the next six to eight weeks. Um, but would it be possible to get a report on the state of our housing stock with a view to looking at it from a health and well-being point of view? Um, I appreciate this might cross over slightly with ISG or, or one of the other scrutiny committees, but I'm particularly coming at this from a health perspective. And is there a bigger piece of work needed in the respect of that? Um, and I'm talking about for full council maybe to consider about looking in much more detail at the quality of our housing stock and the HRA account moving forwards. Thank you, from, thank you for that, Councillor Kingstone. Uh, we will certainly uh, take that on board and uh, we'll make sure that is uh, noted. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to uh, have something to say? Councillor Goodall. That, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I think that's more one for the scrutiny work plan rather than forward plan, just from a... An order of agenda Sorry, point of view. We were talking about the forward plan, not forward plan. Sorry, I'll take that back. We've moved that forward to the next meeting. Not next meeting, next agenda. Yeah, we'll do that. Thank you, Councillor Goodall. Uh, Councillor Claymore. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think there's an item on the forward plan. I think it's for March this year regarding um, the exit plan for reset and recovery. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and what I wanted to suggest is um, 
Being we now have not been successful with the levelling up monies in Tamworth Borough Council, um, can we have some information about how they intend to go forward with um, providing an update on the customer service office face to face, which I think was part of the um, levelling up monies? Okay, we'll take that into consideration and make sure that's looked at. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Thank you. So, so would uh, any working group members under agenda item 12 like to share any updates? Councillor Claymore. Yeah, um, the, is, the update is there isn't an update on the facilities, the toilet facilities in Tamworth at the moment. Um, the working group hasn't met as far as I'm aware, so it's a non-update update. Thank you, Councillor Claymore. So, uh, anybody else? So agenda number 13, item 13, uh, health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. So we've already kicked this one off. <laughs> uh, Councillor Kingston. I'll refer you to my previous comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. All noted, as I've said. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Claymore. Apologies, Chair, I seem to be butting in on everything. Um, I'm not sure whether this is for the working group. I've had some um, contact from quite a few female residents lately saying that the breast screening that was normally provided at um, Sir Robert Peel has now moved on. Now, I, do, I understand it's a mobile unit. However, we did have some um, assurances a couple of years ago that this was going to remain at Robert Peel. So if we could possibly put that on the work plan, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, something to liaise with uh, at a further date. Is that with, the... with the Staffordshire as well. Ah, with Staffordshire County as well. As well. Yep. On, that, on your particular comment there, yep. could you tell me that who now is our representative on Staffordshire County Council for Health and Wellbeing? Yep, it's currently Councillor Dan Maycock. Thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything? Councillor Goodall? Um, yeah, uh, and, and obviously for committee to, to, to sort of consider and think about. And this could be something that uh, this committee has actually looked at before, but um, obviously mental health is, is quite a, a topic that, that we, we talk about quite a lot. And I just wondered what what provision that the the council, Tamworth Borough Council, have for um, looking after its um, employees and indeed members. Um, if there is a scheme, if there's if there's something that's that, that that's open, because. Obviously, we, we, you know, certainly as members, I think we, we, all, we all get to sort of uh, see some of the stuff that, that happens on social media. And um, I think it can affect people sometimes. But I think it also includes um, direct employees. So it's just a topic that I thought could be, could be considered. And obviously, I'm only a substitute, so it's... Uh, Something for, for committee, anyway. Thank you very much. Yep, that's certainly well received. I think that would be a very good idea. Is there anybody else that would like to say anything on this subject? Okay. So, um, if anybody would like to look at the... Uh, um, and if, if you, anybody would like to uh, see any of the uh, 
information on the work plan they can do, they can go and see that. Um, yeah. So uh, it looks like we've covered it all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to close this meeting. The time is 6.50 p.m. Thank you very much.